on this. Thank you very much, everybody, for keeping me on track there. Okay, um, so in chapter five, we're gonna do the reactions of alkenes and alkynes, but we're also introducing that new concept of reaction mechanisms. And so we, we will be going over several different types of mechanisms through the end of the semester, but a lot of them have common themes that we'll see, like the first step will be adding a proton or taking a proton away. So we're gonna recognize these steps as things that happen in the, in the reaction mechanism. A lot of the, the reactions we do, even with other functional groups, will look very similar to this. So having an understanding of these reaction mechanisms and kind of what they're doing is kind of important for helping us be able to figure something out. For example, let's say I throw a couple reagents at you and you're like, I have never seen either of those reagents and I don't know, uh, you know what, what they are. But okay, let's see from my reaction mechanisms, oh, we have an acid catalyst. I probably have to use that. Ooh, uh, this might make a leaving group. Ooh, this might do something else. So just knowing these reaction mechanisms allows us to you know, uh, extrapolate what we're learning to new compounds that we've never seen before. So that's why this is really kind of one of those fundamental goals and my number one goal for chapter five. Okay, <clears throat> so in our book, in our, in our slides, it's reaction as a mechanism is just basically a step-by-step -step description of how the reaction occurs, okay? So we, that's when the bonds are forming or breaking, those will take place in a certain place. Uh, the order in which bonds make or break and their relative rates. Now that's important because if they don't go in a certain order, the re you might actually get a different product than if you did. So order is important in knowing which is the slow step, okay? The slow step is the one that controls the whole reaction. The fast steps just kind of cascade down after you've done that slow step, so that's important. Sometimes solvent plays a key role. Remember when we were deprotonating alkynes, uh, we actually can't do them in certain solvents because of the basicity or the acidity of the solvent. So solvent does play a role. And sometimes we have to have a catalyst. The two most common we have are acid catalyst or base catalyst. So you have to protonate something or deprotonate something to even start the reaction. But then the next thing we also have are metal catalysts, okay? And then what we also need to think about in our reaction is, is energy in, energy out. Some reactions occur spontaneously at room temperature. That means there's a very low activation energy. Some things need a lot of heat and a lot of pressure, okay? So even though these little things spell out the word bore, these are not boring. These are important because it helps us to apply this to any other compound, okay? Excuse me. Okay, so the first thing we want to talk about is our energy diagram. And our energy diagram is just basically a graphical representation of what we're doing. And if we look at our um, y-axis here, this is our energy. And this is typically what we call potential energy, okay? So basically, the chemicals that we have here, those bonds, have a certain amount of energy stored in them, okay? Now, to get that energy out, we have to add energy to the system, and that's this activation energy, to get the chemicals to get to where they are close enough together and in the right configuration to get them to start breaking a bond and start making a bond, okay? So we have the, the chemicals at room temperature when they're standing alone by themselves, that's their potential energy. As we heat the reaction or add them together, we can get to this transition state. Now that's the first thing we have to talk about because it's this imaginary momentary place in time where one bond is partially forming and one bond is partially breaking. So you really can't trap it there. You almost can't see it uh, by most spectroscopic techniques. There are some that are super fast femtosecond experiments that you can see these, but most of the time we call it this transition state. You never actually isolate it. You can't see it, okay? Now, after it reaches this transition state, if the energy continues to form that new bond, you come down this side. What if you start to form it and it goes back to the starting materials? 
Well, that's fine. It just goes back to what it was before and it can react next time. Okay, so that transition state is something, a hump you have to get over, you know, if you're riding up the hill on a bicycle, you gotta make it all the way over the end before you can ride down the other side or else you'll ride down uh, back to where you were. So getting to that, just that apex of that energy is required to get to that next step, okay? So now the next thing we wanna talk about is after we've cascaded down to our products here, we have two things that can happen. Okay, we have what we call the heat of reaction. And basically this is just the change in the potential energy between the starting materials and the products. So if the starting materials have this much energy and our products have a lower amount of stored potential energy, that means that reaction gave off heat or is exothermic, it gave off heat. Okay, what that means is that the energy stored in these bonds is now released because the energy in the bonds down here, it doesn't need that energy, so it has to get rid of that energy, and it does this using heat, and so it emits heat, okay? <clears throat> if we added enough energy to get to this transition state, but the products actually ended up being higher in potential energy than our starting materials, then we have actually absorbed heat, and we call this endothermic, okay? So that endothermic process is where it's all we're looking at is the change in the potential energy of the starting materials and the products, okay? It doesn't make the reaction happen faster. It doesn't ha make that reaction happen slower. It's independent. The thing that makes it run faster or slower is the activation energy. If this barrier is small, we have tend to have a faster reaction because it's easier to get to the transition state. If that activation energy is really big, then it, we tend to go slowly because it takes a lot more time to find enough molecules that actually have enough energy and the right configuration to meet that transition state and cascade down to the product side, okay? So that's what the energy diagram is telling us, okay? So there's also another thing to look about in an energy diagram, an energy diagram is the number of humps you have, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me. So if there are more than one hump, that means you have more than one transition state, okay? And you have more than one activation energy, okay? So let's say we started with our starting materials down here again, and we have this really high activation energy, meaning we had to pump in a lot of heat to get it to go. It finally makes it the transition state, and then it cascades down, but the product we have made so far is still reactive and still can react with something in the solution, okay? If there was nothing, if it was not reactive or was not going to react with something else in the solution, that reaction would be done. So in this case here, we make what we call an intermediate. It's typically a highly reactive species. And we're gonna find out the one we're gonna start with is what we call the carbocation, okay? And then there's a second activation energy. That second activation energy is usually lower than the first activation energy because you've made this reactive intermediate. And then your reactive intermediate now reacts with something in the solution to give us our second transition state, and then we cascade down to products again. Again, it doesn't matter how high these activation energies are, the potential energy at the end here on whether it's exothermic or endothermic is independent of those activation energies. But the higher your activation energy, the slower it goes. The slower your active energy, the faster it goes. Okay, so those are how we visualize these reactions and knowing that we have transition states, which are momentary, two molecules colliding in space. An intermediate is something we can actually isolate or see by spectroscopy or some other analytical method. We can actually see that intermediate. We can't always trap it and isolate it, but we typically can see it by some form or another. And then again, we go through our next transition state, okay. So the definitions we need to make sure we know are transition state, this imaginary forming and breaking of bonds all at one time, okay? The second thing we need to know is activation energy. If it's big, 
it's slow. If it's small, it's fast. Okay. And that's just how much energy has to be in those two molecules that are coming together to form and break a bond at the same time to make that happen. So think about it as adding enough energy to both of the reactants so that they can actually form and break bonds to get to that transition state. The next thing we want to look at is the heat of the reaction. If heat is liberated, it's an exothermic reaction. If heat is absorbed, it's an endothermic reaction. And we'll see both of these in the reactions we do. It's very common to have either one, but they both are. It's just a definition. It's not whether or not the reaction is going to work or not. So a reaction intermediate is highly reactive, but occasionally can be isolated and or at least seen. And the rate determining step is the slowest step to happen. So in the case of our double hump uh, right here, oops, in the case of our double hump here, that, that reactive intermediate there is the rate determining step forming that because the biggest activation energy determines the speed of the reaction. Okay. So now that we have these definitions out of the way and that visualization about how uh, we can just kind of uh, anticipate how the reaction is going, let's look at the first five patterns on when something's gonna happen first. Basically, we're looking at five things that happen to create that first transition state, that rate determining step, okay? So the first pattern we have is the addition of a proton. Okay, so this happens a lot when we have an acid base reaction or we have an acid catalyzed reaction. You transfer a proton first. Now, these can happen very quickly in acid base reactions or they can happen very slowly if we're trying to do it in, in, a, in some other, uh, in a non acidic proton. So just because we're adding a proton doesn't mean it's fast, it just means it happens first. So in the case of this uh, species right here, we actually have an acid, and it is a Bronsted-Lowry acid because it's transferring a proton, but it's also a Lewis acid because it, this species is accepting the electrons from the nitrogen here, okay? So remember, we do a curved arrow with two prongs if we're moving two electrons here. So we have an equilibrium where we can transfer this proton back and forth, and it all depends on that pKa tells us which way it lies. Okay. So the second thing we can have happen is we can take a proton away. So this happens a lot when we have what we call based catalyzed reactions, where you actually remove a proton to create that reactive species. Okay. In this case, it's just the opposite reaction from the previous slide. The Lewis base became the Lewis acid when it got the proton, and it can now act as an acid to go back the other way. So uh, accepting a proton or taking a proton away are the first two patterns we'll see in a lot of these reactions. Okay, the next pattern is going completely thinking about Lewis acid, Lewis base, okay? A reaction of an electrophile with a nucleophile to form a new covalent bond. Okay, so an electrophile is anything that wants to accept electrons to form a covalent bond, i.e. Lewis acid, okay? That's why I think everything we do in organic chemistry can be boiled down to Lewis acid and Lewis base. <clears throat> but we also have this name electrophile and nucleophile, which we can apply. It's easier sometimes to say that instead of Lewis acid, Lewis base. A nucleophile or something that likes positive charge has the electrons already and is willing to share with something that doesn't have as much electrons. So an electrophile is looking for electrons, a nucleophile is looking for that partially positive or positive charge, okay? So this reaction happens a lot. In fact, we'll have entire mechanisms based around the name nucleophile. So we'll get to that in a few, couple chapters. Okay, so this is our number three pattern, reaction of an electrophile with a nucleophile, okay? The third thing that can happen is what we call a rearrangement of a bond, okay? Sometimes we'll see one bond move over one carbon to make the intermediate more stable. 
Okay, so the most of the time we're going to we're going to introduce this as a carbocation rearrangement. Okay, and when we do this, we move one bond over one carbon, and it can either be a bond to a hydrogen or a bond to a methyl group. Typically, that's the, what we're going to learn, and it only moves one carbon over, and it only moves one group, and so we have this rearrangement of a bond, and it basically only does it to save energy, and we'll see that happen again uh, later in this talk. Okay, and the last pattern we have is breaking a bond to form a stable molecule or ion. Now, in pattern three, we had a nucleophile react with an electrophile, right? Pattern five is what could happen before pattern three happens because we're actually generating something that has a positive charge. So it is now an electrophile. This carbocation is now our electrophile. It's looking for electrons. And our bromine now has a negative charge. So it's now our nucleophile. It's looking for that positive charge. Okay. So in so pattern three is the reverse of pattern five, just like pattern two is the reverse of pattern one, okay? So these five patterns happen again and again, and you'll see to recognize this in most of the chemistry we do, okay? There's a few things that don't fall under this, and I will point those out as we get to them. All right, questions on patterns right now? Everybody's pretty quiet. The chat's still not going. Everybody seems to be streaming still. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> for example, in the reaction where we had an, an alkene react with a protonated water, we're actually seeing pattern one because we had to add a proton to water to make it an electrophile. And then that means the now electrophile can be reacted by a nucleophile. The nucleophile is the double bond because of that lone pair that, I'm sorry, <clears throat> that double bond, those, the, those electrons in that p orbital are kind of sticking out. They're not in between the atoms, they're sticking out. So they are looking to share those electrons with something. So when we do this reaction, we're actually doing pattern number one first, we've transferred a proton, and then pattern number two, the newly protonated species is acting as an electrophile, okay? And this is the acid-catalyzed hydration of an alkene, okay? Now, when we have something like water react with a carbocation, then we have what we call pattern number three. The water acts as a nucleophile because it has a lone pair that it can share with that partially positive, that positive charge on carbon. The carbon is the electrophile because it has a positive charge and it wants to get those electrons. So when we react a carbocation with something else, that's typically the pattern number three of a nucleophile reacting with an electrophile, okay? So in the case of the last part of the reaction where we react water, with a nucleophile, when we form that oxonium cation as an intermediate, and at the end of that reaction, we transfer that proton back to the solvent, okay? So that's pattern number two. So the patterns can happen in each step. Each step can follow a different pattern in the reaction. So just in the acid uh, catalyzed hydration of an alkene, we're seeing a transfer of proton, an attack by a nucleophile, and then a, taking a proton away. We're seeing both. We're seeing one happen, then three happen, then two happen. So we'll see this again and again. Okay. Now, when we added bromine to a, a an alkene, we actually have that's pattern three because. The double bond on the carbons here, remember that pi bond has electrons above and below that plane. Therefore, it is the nucleophile. It's looking for somebody to share that with. Now, typically we wouldn't think of bromine as an electrophile, but because the double bond's acting as the nucleophile, and when it does break the bond, 
between here, it's giving these electrons here, giving a partially positive charge, which then reacts with the carbon, giving us a positive charge here. So the double bond is acting as a nucleophile to grab electrons from something and generates an intermediate, which then can now also react as an electrophile now. Okay, so in fact, let's look at the next step there. Now that we have this, the bromine is now the nucleophile and that three-membered ring is now our electrophile and therefore it also is a pattern three, okay? So does that make sense? See how we can start to recognize these patterns in each of the reactions we've already looked at, okay? <clears throat> now pattern four happens a lot when we have a difference in the possibility of a carbocation. If we add our hydrogen in our Mikovnikov's addition, when we do that, we see that we form a cation. If that cation is not the most stable cation possible, i.e. a tertiary cation, it will try to rearrange by moving either a hydrogen or a methyl group to get to that more stable product. And we'll see that happen. And that's pattern number four, electrophile nucleophile rearrangement. I'm sorry, rearrangement is number four. Okay, so the first step of that reaction where we have the alkene react with the hydrogen is pattern one. We've added the proton to get to that carbocation. And then if it rearranges, that's pattern four. It rearranges from the secondary carbocation to the more stable tertiary carbocation. So start thinking about all of these different five patterns will show up time and time again, okay? And then, <clears throat> Uh, we have that. We also have, I wanted to note here is that in the top one here, we're moving a methyl group, a CH3 or a C, uh, some kind of carbon is moving from one carbon to the next. In this case here, we have hydrogen moving from one carbon to the next. So we can have migration of a methyl group or sometimes opening a ring. And sometimes we have just the migration of a hydrogen. It still counts as a rearrangement. It still counts as a one, two shift. Okay. And that brings up the reaction that doesn't seem to follow any of these, but if we look at it carefully, it does. This is the hydroboration followed by oxidation, okay? So in this case, the boron's actually not the most electronegative atom, and therefore it's actually partially positive. The hydrogen, which we normally expect to be the more electropositive atom, is not. And therefore, it reacts backwards from what we think of it should, but it all follows pattern three, okay? The alkene is still the electrophile. And in this case, the hydrogen is the partially negative charge, which makes it the nucleophile and the boron is the partially positive, making it the electrophilic side of that bond. That's why it seems to add backwards from Markovnikov, but it is actually following the rules by having the electrophile and nucleophile pattern of reaction. Note, we know this to be true because of that syn addition, because they add on the same side, it has to be this type of partially negative uh, hydrogen and partially positive boron, okay? <coughs> oh, man, let's see there. So that also comes up to just the straight hydrogenation. The straight hydrogenation where you absorb the hydrogen to the surface there, we also have an electrophile nucleophile type pattern here. The, again, the Diene, the alkene, the double bond, is acting as the nucleophile because it has the excess electrons. The hydrogen on the surface now is less electronegative and therefore is the electrophile looking to find electrons to share with it to give us this uh, example here. So this alkene is the nucleophile because it has the electrons. This is the electrophile because it's looking for the electrons. If I said that backwards, I'm going to say that backwards. 
Okay, and let's look at our last reaction here. In acetylide ion, what we have is again, the reaction between the electrophile and the nucleophile, where the acetylide ion now has a negative charge. When you have a negative charge, you typically are a nucleophile. And so you're looking for something to react with. In the case of this species here, we actually have a polarized bond. We have a carbon and a chlorine. The chlorine is more electronegative. If the chlorine is more electronegative, that's gonna polarize that bond. So you don't have to have a full positive charge to get electrophile and nucleophile reaction. You just have to have a partial charge or an excess of electrons. So in this case here, we have excess of electrons, meaning it wants to look for a positive charge. Here you have a polarized bond, so you have a partially positive sign. So those electrons start to attack that partially positive carbon, creating our new carbon-carbon bond. Okay, so that being said, do we understand that what a mechanism is, what an energy diagram is, and looking for those first five patterns in the mechanisms, okay? That's what I wanna get out of right now. Go ahead and unmute and chime in if you have questions. Okay. So what we'll see here is when I go on to the next step, which is, uh, oh, where's my goals? I've got a lot of slides here. Uh, so what we'll do when we go to carbocations is we're gonna look at why carbocations exist and then between knowing the stability of carbocations, knowing that they rearrange and knowing reaction mechanisms, we're gonna go through all the reactions again, kind of solidifying both of those two things and making you look for those patterns again and again and again, okay? Okay, um, we are at 1240, so this is our first bio break. Um, anybody have any questions before we go ahead and let's just take 10 minutes, come back and we will finish the last two goals for this one. Okay. Any issues with that? No, good. All right. I will see you back here at 1250, 10 minutes. We'll, we'll take on the last two goals. Okay. I'm going to stop share and I'm going to end so it'll stop recording.